uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about the, did I do this before? No, about the famous Ellington Basie joint recording session. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, well this remarkable two big band session uh, of the Ellington and Basie bands, uh, uh, it came about in a strange way, but I, I don't really go into that, but it, it was made possible by some, you know, Bob Thiel, who was somebody that I could talk about <laughs> at length anyway, uh, you know, famous producer. He was really responsible for this ha being able to happen. But uh, I was there and it was a remarkable display of, you know, just to have these two bands together in one place. This was done in that beautiful, wonderful studio that Columbia had at the time on 30th Street, which was a converted church, and it had wood paneling, and it had a marvelous sound, probably the best sound of any studio I've ever been in. And of course, Columbia let it go. There was a developer, the real estate developers, and that's, you know, where Trump comes from. And the worst people in Manhattan, you know, are kind of responsible for tearing down beautiful buildings and building these ridiculous high rises that make, you know, city look like it's built for giraffes. Anyway, you know, they, they, they sold that studio and destroyed it. It was a wonderful studio. Great sound. And uh, so there were these two bands, uh, and the way they had them arranged, uh, the, uh, the rhythm sections, two of them were on the highest risers, and one on the right, one on the left, and the bass players next to them. And then uh, there were the brasses on the next, you know, these were, what do you call them, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, on the bottom were the reed sections, and they were on the floor, and they were arranged like like a snake. You know, they were like facing. There's ten of them. You know, and they were sort of like facing each other in the round. Piano off to the side, grand piano, uh, and uh, all these people. You know, it's. it's amazing to have them all in one room and then the uh, uh, you know the there were there was music from both bands and uh, there were alternations in uh, the piano chair but that was entering Billy was on hand too uh, actually Ellington did most of the piano work because Basie was extremely deferential to Duke. You could tell that he absolutely, you know, admired Duke and didn't feel that he was in the, on the same level almost, so to speak. And he was almost like a fan, you know. And uh, Ellington wanted him to play some piano things and he said, no, let, you know, let Billy play them, like uh, Billy did wind up playing some. And uh, it was just remarkable because all the material, of course, some of it was familiar, but it had never been done in that double manner. And uh, it worked out remarkably well. And, uh, of course, as I said, you know, Basie was deferring to Ellington, and Ellington was really the one who, you know, who ran the thing. And uh, there was a break, and uh, on the break, a bunch of guys and and I went with them. There was a little bar on the corner of 30th Street and 3rd Avenue. There was a little neighborhood bar on the corner of the I want to have a couple of drinks. So we walked in there about <laughs> about 12 or 14. 
musicians that even walk into this bar where they were like it was in the daytime of course there were a few people sitting there <laughs> look up <out> the, <laughs> all these all these cats came in that's like uh, anyway one thing that will tell something about the difference between the two bands. Well, incidentally, I mean, everybody got along fine, and there were people who had been in both bands, like Butter Jackson, who was then with Basie, but had been with Ellington, and uh, somebody else who, you know, and uh, uh, of course the, 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 the rhythm sections had fun with each other, uh, and they would alternate. You wouldn't have two drummers in one thing, except for Battle Royal, I think. But at the end, they did jumping at the woodside, and the trumpets were on top and the risers, you know, uh, each on each on the, one on the right and one on the left. So when it came to the, uh, you know, the part at the end where the trumpets go, blah, 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 you know, so, so. the basic guys got up, the basic guys stood up, okay, and they could see I was interested in what was going to happen. So the Ellington guys, they're kind of, you know, according, but after a while they got up too. <laughs> the victory. <laughs> hey, uh, that was quite an achievement to get them to get up. Nobody said anything. The Duke, Duke didn't gesture, but, but that was a wonderful ending, I think. You know. But there was no, there was really no rivalry. I mean, they got together and played each other's music, just the way it should have been. And I think you can only really appreciate this recording if you have some pretty good speakers and you put it up at full blast. It would be hard for you to do it on a, on a because you, you want to get that full sound. The way they filled up that beautiful studio, wow, I don't think the recording could really capture that. So that was a unique event and uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember exactly how the sequence went, but it was possible to do this. It basically was signed with Roulette and, uh, of course, Ellington with Columbia. And there had been something where somebody borrowed an artist without permission from one label to the other, and then they were able to, you know, to to get the uh, approval to get to, to be able to do this. Anyway. You, you're, you're making me think of something, which is, is that about the time that Duke does the session with Lewis for roulette? Is that yeah. conjoined? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, that, that, that may be exactly what happened, that the, these two things were like, an agreement to be able to do this because somebody had borrowed something from the other. And it was Steele who uh, managed to do that. Uh, Were you at the Duke Lewis session? Mm -hmm. Were you at the Duke Lewis session? Yes, I was. I was at the Duke Lewis session. And that was, needless to say, a great experience. And again, I've written about that. I think I did the notes at least to one of the there was two yeah. albums. Uh, this again was an example of Louis' ability to sight read and to uh, absolutely take in music that he had not played in some cases of course there were tunes that he was familiar with from hearing them but had never played them and pick it up right from the and remarkably I wrote about that and no, it's a, they did black and tan fantasy and Barney was there you know Barney who to played it a thousand times had forgotten the routine and Louis straightened him out he's the one who played it to what he should have played, he played it for him. So I go, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, it, 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 it was a beautiful thing to watch, you know. I mean, it, it, it was uh, seeing Ellington in a position of, you know, really being with an equal, which, which wasn't the usual situation. How many equals did he have, you know? So, uh, and they're very different personalities from different backgrounds. And of course, they had done things before live, I mean, quite often actually, uh, but not to this extent. I mean, they're meeting Louis Duke playing a couple of numbers together spontaneously, something like that. So anyway, it, it, it was fascinating to, to watch all that. And uh, maybe the most interesting was Azalea, which is this beautiful tune that Ellington says he was inspired to write when he read in Louis's first autobiography in Swing That Music, where Louis talks about getting lost uh, on, a, on an outing uh, you know, in, uh, in uh, Louisiana and straying into uh, forest or garden where the azaleas are blooming. Nankis, be that as it may, uh, Ellington had written this song and the lyric which is a bit, shall we say, a bit fanciful in so far as, you know, one of the rhymes is with Azalea is nothing can assail ya, Azalea, my love, <laughs> which is, I mean, that's pretty good, you know. It works. Uh, so Duke had attempted to record this uh, with a vocal, of course, and had not succeeded in getting a satisfactory result. One of the people who tried to do this uh, uh, was Al Hibbler, it didn't work, and another was a guy named Chester Crumpler. <laughs> so, Louis was really in a position uh, to nail this for the first time. And did he ever? I mean, Duke sat down uh, 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 and held up the music, and, next, and Louis put a mute in, and he was sitting opposite him, and they sit together, and started doing this. And Louis really ran the uh, the instrumental part. You know, he got that down as he always did very quickly. And then came the vocal for that, you know, Duke moved to the piano and uh, <coughs> and again they had a couple of times to find the right tempo. They found the right tempo. Louis did it impeccably, you know, and Ellington you could tell how happy he was to, you know, have finally been able to get a satisfactory recording of this very pretty tune. So that was probably the highlight of, of the session. And uh, it was really remarkable how much, Duke played wonderful piano on it. Uh, uh, one in particular, uh, just a lucky so-and-so, uh, <laughs> But throughout, <clears throat> and it was again Bob Thiel who managed to do this by getting Louis through Joe Glazer, getting an agreement for Joe to leave Louis alone for you know for a couple of days and not book him somewhere, which is the same thing that Milt Gabler did in 1956, I guess, to do that big uh, Louis retrospective. He also made a deal with Glazer. So anyway, Louis had just gotten back from, from Europe actually, and was not, his chops were a bit tender. He, he did put some spirits of nitrate on him during the session, but he, as usual, I mean, he was such a trooper, uh, he didn't let that, restrain him from doing his best. 
Duke, on the other hand, early in the, in the session, complained that he had a headache, but I think that Louis blew that headache away. Uh, so, you know, very different person, but they had been together before. Louis used to come and sit in when Duke had the small group every year at the, uh, at the, uh, Rainbow room? Uh, no, the uh, Radio City uh, Rainbow Room. Yeah. The Duke would have the small band, it was an octet, and Louis would come and sit in with them. Uh, did I have, did I, speaking of Duke and Stark, did I ever tell my story about the three band leaders in one night? Did I tell yeah, you? Yeah. Well, yeah, you have that, right? 